Welcome, Mark. Thanks so much for coming. Um, could you tell me a little bit about what you guys do at Smile Identity? Sure. So Smile Identity is a company focused on making it easy for people to prove their identity and get access to uh, essentially a digital modern lifestyle. And we're primarily focused on emerging markets um, where identity is not something that um, sort of can be taken for granted. Uh, in, the, in the markets that we focus on, uh, primarily what we're focusing on is, is allowing consumers to get access to things like financial services. So this could be opening up a bank account, it could be getting access to a loan, it could be getting a SIM card, which is used for mobile money. Um, and in this process, in this journey, we enable companies to validate the true identity of a user by combining face recognition with ID validation. Uh, and so this is the sort of the two parts of the Smile Identity Value Proposition. So um, we had a panel a few months or a month or so ago on um, protecting yourself from SIM swaps. I had um, my SIM hacked twice within two weeks. Um, yeah, I didn't lose any money, but it was pretty scary. Um, and uh, a guy in New Zealand approached me via LinkedIn who had a similar um, business. And um, he was saying, you know, this is, he'd actually, so they'd actually had it sold to Vodafone in New Zealand who was using that. And I said, well, why aren't all the cell phone companies here using this? Because, um, you know, even right after I'd had the hack, then one of my panelists who'd come from New York, she got hacked, I found out on Facebook and T-Mobile were like not, the fraud department weren't answering her calls. And, yeah. you know, so this is like, so when you're on the other end of this it's something- It's incredibly frustrating and it's frightening. And and um, a guy in um, Bitgo actually lost like th hundred thousand or something in um, crypto after right. he was hacked. It's so. particularly uh, pernicious if you've got um, a crypto balance tied to that SIM or tied to a, a phone number. I should say tied to a phone number where that phone number is being used as a one-time password. So, um, yes. So you've identified some of the challenges that are associated with using a phone number as a true means of identity. And this is essentially why we've used biometrics. Um, so if you think about um, accessing a high value account, whether it's a cryptocurrency account, or maybe um, it's a bank account and, and maybe you're a consumer, uh, not in the United States, you could be in, a, in, a, in maybe a, an emerging economy um, and your phone is kind of your, your lifeline for most activities. Um, it's often uh, common that people will use one-time password to validate their identity. And, and this second factor form of authentication has become widely used. Uh, the problem is it's not always secure. And in particularly, if you've got a man in the loop uh, at the telco or someone who's got access to your, your physical device and can ultimately um, um, either redirect one-time passwords not to the SIM that's in your card or, or physically actually change the SIM that's in your card, um, you as a consumer are at great risk. Mm -hmm. So the, the reason we, we started with the idea of using biometrics or face recognition is that rather than um, second factor being simply something you have, um, we, we prefer a second factor that is something that you are. Uh, and so in the case of a, a, a cell phone being used um, to try to steal your identity, it makes it much more difficult for someone to essentially uh, steal your identity if to get access to that wallet or get access to that account, they actually have to give a selfie instead of um, just receiving a one-time password. So what we really do is we, we use biometrics to enroll a user for a partner. And our partners could be, uh, they are, for example, lenders, um, banks, uh, mobile money companies in Africa. And those companies usually have an app or some onboarding process for a consumer. During that onboarding process, they're often asking consumers to take a selfie but they don't typically do much with that selfie other than just realizing that they've got an account there. What we enable is that that selfie can now, now be used both for identity validation at the point of account creation, yeah. but also for re-authentication. So now when you wanna do a second factor authentication for that user, you can request that they just give you another selfie. You confirm that against the one that was registered, and now you've got a biometric remote second factor authentication that essentially um, can't be defeated through a SIM swap process. So the scary thing here is that, um, you know, I was dealing with T-Mobile and, I mean, finally they put me on a, a SIM swap protected account. Mm -hmm. um, and I said to them, why don't, why aren't all your customers on that? Because yeah. it's getting worse and worse. And they're like, oh, we have a small team. And I'm thinking, well, what about AI? And like, I'm sure there's like companies like yourself. So you guys have got a, a big task in front of you because these carriers just see us as cash cows. Like we're, they're just getting money from us and they don't want to 
actually make it different. And I yeah. know that initially it wasn't, a, the a cell phone wasn't seen as a point of authorization. And now everyone uses it. I mean, Twitter does it if you get locked out of your account. And I don't even receive the texts or the calls for some reason. I don't know why, but for some reason I don't receive them. And so and I get locked out of my account. Well, and I'm really like, goes, why really don't they your, use other authorizations? Yeah, this really goes back to one of the questions I think you, you were talking about um, before we started this, which was, you know, what is digital identity? Um, and I think it's a, it's a fun sort of abstract question, but there's some real questions around, um, do we want to build a world in which our phone number is essentially our identity? Do we want to build? Do we want to build a world in which you have to use your social security number all the time and share it with lots of different participants? Um, and I think these are really important questions as you construct new services, whether those are financial services, uh, shared economy services. And our view on this is ultimately that you want to be able to allow consumers to permission some of their information um, with their own consent, uh, and be, to be able to use biometrics to essentially put a a unique fingerprint on a particular transaction when they choose to do so, yeah. uh, to have a higher level of security. So a lot of this um, has been done inside of the Apple ecosystem, of course, Apple with Face ID and Touch ID. The challenge is that if you don't have an Apple device, how do you make these solutions work if you're a bank and you're operating across, let's say, um, you know, 100 different types of devices, or yeah. if you're a telco and you've got 17 countries you might be operating in. Yeah. Uh, you can't build everything you know, solely to one hardware manufacturer. So we've tried to build solutions that are essentially hardware agnostic right. um, and that ultimately work for consumers even if they have very low powered devices. Okay. Um, and so what do you see, I'm sorry for taking up so much space, but it's, mm -hmm. I'm These are very passionate about this. Um, yeah. And when um, you feel the experience of having your identity either stolen or lost or terrifying. being able to prove who you are, yeah. that's when this becomes very real. Uh, for a lot of the, the, the end users of our products, it's you know, they've experienced fraud to some extent, but more often than not, they're on the other side of this, where because of their location, because of their IP address, because of the geography that they're in, they are um, at risk of being um, locked out of services or unfairly um, uh, uh, um, receiving suspicion. Um, so, you know, if you're a Nigerian consumer and you're trying to do an online credit card transaction and your IP address says you're in Lagos, uh, there are certain companies that will just block you outright. Yeah. Um, and, and we think that that just can't be the way of the world in, in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there have to be better solutions for people to be able to prove who they are and that they're a legitimate consumer and do so in a way that allows them to get access to all the, the things that they want to get access to. So we may have covered the answers to the question, my next question, which was basically um, like, what do you see as the main concern at the moment for us at, with our own digital security? Yeah, I think um, it, a lot of this depends on where you sit. And what I mean by that is, you know, when we're sitting here in, in San Francisco, um, you know, the conversation is often around privacy and control, especially what we've seen with social media and social networks the last few years. People are attuned to that. Um, if we were sitting perhaps in, in um, Nairobi or Dar es Salaam, there would still be a concern about privacy. Uh, and there's still is, you know, very legitimate concerns about, about those things. And now we're seeing actual legislation come through uh, in, in some markets uh, like Kenya and, and Nigeria around digital privacy. Um, but there's also a very, a very um, important equal concern around access. Mm -hmm. So making sure that people actually have a credential that they can use and that the credential is widely accepted um, and that they um, are, are able to prove their identity when it matters, uh, whether that's getting access to things, uh, public services or, or private goods. And so I think, you know, ultimately this revolves back around consumer control. So how do you put consumers back in control of their information? Whether that means permissioning access to, to private information, or whether that means giving them a credential that's valuable enough for them to get access to the things that they want. And so what's your personal vision of where we're going to go in the future? I um, mean, is it hopeful or not? <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm actually, this is a conversation um, where I've heard uh, often very dark points of view on, uh, on the future, but I also see a lot of reasons to be optimistic. And I think the fact that people are actively talking about this, and I identity is like, you know, it's a hot topic now. It's in newspapers and it's being written up in, in The Economist. And um, McKinsey just put out a report, I think, not too long ago about digital identity. So the fact that there's a real conversation starting now about this, I think, means that you can actually start being hopeful about the future. Um, will we see a, a digital privacy bill in the United States 
uh, at some point in the future. I mean, we're already seeing it in California. You know, when will we see it at the federal level? I think that will be a, a really important um, watermark. Okay. But what I think is, the, is um, a, a very bright future is one in which consumers have more control about what information they want to permission yeah. and that there are easy to use uh, um, products, whether they're uh, hardware products like, like the iPhone um, or software products like mobile apps that allow you to selectively permission information um, and do what are called, it's going to sound um, a bit wonky, but do like zero knowledge proofs or verifiable claims um, with parties uh, without having to share all of your information. Yes. And I think that's, that's a very interesting and exciting future. The challenge really is educating consumers. And that's not really going to happen unless you have products that are just intuitive and easy to use. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to build software that is really easy to use for people. Um, it's a very natural action. You take a selfie, um, you type in a number, and you're done. Yep. Um, but I think that there's actually even better things coming in the future where um, you could, in fact, move some of these kinds of um, authentication methods offline okay. uh, and do them without even having to have cell phones. So we're starting to see really interesting things um, in offline authentication in Africa that are making us excited about the future. Fantastic. Well, that's very hopeful. We'll finish there. Thanks so much for coming, and I think it'll be a great panel. Cool. Thank you very, very much for having me.